welcome to this session on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about uh, the Gothic landscape and how the landscape has symbolic resonances for the values um, that we think are embedded in the narrative of Frankenstein. Now, let's go back to that uh, originary narrative which we discussed in the previous uh, lectures um, and in it we talked how the moment of inception in Villa Diodati had implications for the structure and content of uh, Shelley's Frankenstein. So we know that the idea for the novel emerged at the Villa Diodati but uh, we, we still have to consider how far uh, the ambience uh, of the weather, the hostile weather, had implications uh, for uh, the resonances, the thematic resonances, as well as the structural principles of this uh, novel. So the novel emerged at the Villa Deodati on the shores of Lake Geneva during the stormy month of June 1816. Um, so much is explained by Mary Shelley herself in the preface. Um, it is not well known, however, that the stormy weather was the result of an Indonesian volcano which affected the atmosphere of the northern hemisphere for three years, leading to crop failure, riots, and starvation. Mary Shelley's other writings of the period, as well as Frankenstein, reveal her interest in and concern for nature and the countryside. To a large extent, the novel is a reflection of these concerns at a time when the natural world was in crisis. So, What's very apparent is the uh, context in which uh, Mary Shelley produced um, this novel, how she got the, um, you know, uh, the idea for the novel, um, but we, we really don't know the implications of the hostile weather during that period. And in fact, um, the Indonesian volcano is much talked about and, um, and because of that eruption, because of the kind of... Um, the, the migration of the fumes, so to speak, um, to the northern hemisphere um, has uh, produced, uh, had produced a lot of uh, negative impacts in terms of the uh, cultivation. So there was crop failure, which led to riots and people starved. So these implications of hostile weather is, is something that Mary Shelley um, had observed really acutely. And that was also kind of symbolically written into um, this uh, fiction, Frankenstein. So um, this novel also reveals um, Mary Shelley's deep interest in nature, you know, the, how, how nature changes its patterns and um, how that change has an impact on uh, the way the society kind of shifts and changes it in order to adapt. Um, so this novel kind of reflects on that, speculates on this, and it, it kind of discusses that idea um, in, in a very, very subtle manner. There are a couple of storms. There are two storms in the novel, uh, and uh, in the first storm is a boyhood memory for Victor Frankenstein, um, who uh, I'm quoting from the novel. He uh, says that when I was about 15 years old, we had retired to our house near Bell Reef when we witnessed a most violent and terrible thunderstorm. It advanced from behind the mountain of Jura, and the thunder burst at once with frightful loudness and with, from various quarters of the heavens. I remained while the storm lasted, watching its progress with curiosity and delight. As I stood at the door, on a sudden I beheld a stream of fire issue from an old and beautiful oak which stood about twenty yards from our house. And so soon as the dazzling light vanished, the oak had disappeared and nothing remained but a blasted stump. When you read this passage um, on a very literal level, it kind of depicts for the readers the impact of a kind of horrifying, terrible thunderstorm. Um, it, its violence is kind of um, illustrated um, through the impact uh, on, on this oak uh, tree, but there is, as I have been pointing out, a symbolic um, resonance to uh, the hostile weather 
uh, and that symbolism is what is very, very um, poignant here. So there is a very old and beautiful oak, and, and that is important, um, you know, that, that oak could be representative of several ideas. It could represent the promise of Victor Frankenstein. It could represent um, tradition itself, you know, the, the continuity of tradition, and that gets attacked. And that is what uh, this terrible and violent, terrible uh, thunderstorm attacks. And when when um, it is over, uh, you can see that you know it, it, the tree kind of bursts into fire. And at the end of that uh, episode, nothing remains but a blasted stump. So that's where um, there is a powerful message that there is rupture. Uh, in Frankenstein, it's a, it's a gothic rupture and something new and terrible is born, which is dreadful to look. And that's what Frankenstein does when he kind of births that monster. It's so terrible to look that he kind of flees um, from that sight, uh, from that horrid sight of the monster, the creature that he had uh, brought into that world, into this world. There is uh, the second storm in the novel, and the second storm is associated with the sudden appearance of the monster. Um, and I'm quoting from the uh, novel here, a flash of lightning illuminated the object and discovered its shape plainly to me, its gigantic stature and the deformity of its aspect more hideous that belongs to humanity instantly informed me that it was the wretch, the filthy demon to whom I had given life. It is as if the storm were responsible for the creature's existence. It is eliminated and discovered by the lightning in a rather similar way to later cinematic depictions of the monster's birth. So the storm is uh, significant uh, in a sense that in a very primitive way, it lights up the features of um, the creature very, very clearly, vividly to uh, Victor Frankenstein. So he kind of looks at the creature and through his eyes, the readers are also looking at that creature. It's gigantic. It's massive stature. It's, it's huge um, because... If you have read the novel, you would know that uh, Victor had to work with uh, big parts. He kind of uh, finds it easier to kind of put together um, put together this body in a, in a big in a bigger way than in a smaller fashion because it's it's easier to work with um, a la in a larger scale. Um, so it's gigantic uh, stature. It's very threatening and it's deformed uh, in its aspect. Um, there is disability of, of um, some kind and it's it doesn't kind of belong to um, humanity because it's hideous and look at the way in which um, Frankenstein calls this creature as the wretch um, you know as something which is in the margins which is pathetic as well as horrifying uh, it's a filthy you know a dirty demon and and he had given life to it so um, the, the the storm is eliminating this um, this creature in a physical and metaphorical way for uh, the creator as well as for the uh, readers and this moment is made much use of in later kind of cinematic adaptations as well it's, it's a powerful scene uh, and, and the storm is used to great effects um, in the adaptations now uh, let's kind of um, further probe the relationship between the landscape the hostile landscape and uh, the monster um, it is not a coincidence, according to the critic Bill Phillips, that the monster's movements are perpetually mountainwards and northwards towards the cold, barren places where human survival, indeed life itself, is threatened and ultimately extinguished. Just as much life in the Northern Hemisphere between 1816 and 1818 was similarly threatened and extinguished by darkness and cold. So, that reality of that period between 1816 and 1818 is what is kind of depicted uh, in the arid, um, uh, in a sense, that in the frigid um, landscapes uh, to which uh, um, this monster is constantly traveling to. So uh, those landscapes are hardly the place for human survival, for life itself, but um, the monster kind of uh, moves uh, towards it perpetually, towards the mountains, towards northwards, and um, the area is kind of, uh, is an area of darkness and coldness there's hardly any warmth so 
the, the monster seems to kind of uh, inhabit those spaces and thereby underlying its um, inhumanity, so to speak. Uh, so it's, it's a different kind of creature which, which uh, prefers a different kind of landscape. Further uh, implications of the um, Gothic landscape in terms of the metaphoric figurations of uh, the monster's character. When Frankenstein uh, returns to Switzerland and marries his fiance Elsbeth, um, we, we know that she gets murdered in her bridal chamber by the creature, by the monster. Frankenstein's response is to seek vengeance, and the novel concludes with his pursuit of the monster ever northwards to the Arctic Sea. In a message left by the creature, Frankenstein reads, Follow me, I seek the everlasting ices of the north where you will feel the misery of cold and frost to which I am impassive. So these are some of the powerful um, lines, uh, powerful ideas in the entire uh, novel. Um, you, you can also kind of um, kind of sense the gothic uh, flavor emerging, the gothic kind of mood emerging from the uh, landscape. Um, we did see uh, previously in our discussions about the sublime um, as to how uh, something massive, something hostile uh, is, is uh, as simultaneously beautiful as well as, you know, kind of, um, you know, awe inspiring and, and striking terror into the hearts of human beings. So these everlasting ices of the north are sublime to look at. They are beautiful, but they're also hostile. They, they are not conducive to human um, habitation and survival, yet the creature kind of um, haunts these spaces and um, you know th there is a connection between the misery of cold and frost that one can experience in these northern uh, landscapes of eyes and um, the, the, the kind of uh, reaction that the monster gets from society itself, like he, he is kind of cold shouldered. The monster is cold shouldered not only by um, his creator, the father figure, Victor, but also by the rest of um, society as well. So um, that symbolic coldness seems to be kind of literalized in, in these moments um, of, of nature, in these kind of pockets of nature. And it's, it's very um, poignant to kind of um, see that the monster says that I am impassive, I am kind of uh, immune to the hostility that that emerges from the landscape. Um, he, he says that I am used to it uh, because of the experiences that he gathered from human society. So it's a very uh, ironic um, comment, poignant comment um, that, that comes from the mouth of the creature. How do we finally come to understand uh, the nature of the relationship between um, the monster and the gothic landscape? Uh, we do realize that everyone close to Frankenstein is touched by the hand of death, just as the natural world between 1816 and 1818 lay moribund beneath a cold black sky. Uh, the monster's behavior, together with its ability to understand unbelievable hardship and deprivation, clearly sets him apart from humanity. His indifference towards his victims, at least until the final chapter, is the, difference of a, is the indifference of a force of nature, incapable neither of remorse nor of rational justification. A monstrous volcano of destruction spreading darkness and despair wherever he passes like an angel of death, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein then attempts to give meaning to a natural disaster. So if you if you look at this kind of uh, criticism, you realize that, you know, just as uh, Frankenstein, the novel, and, and is, is full of deaths, it, there are plenty of people who get murdered uh, at the hands of uh, the creature, and Frankenstein is, is kind of horrified by the deaths, um, uh, which, are, which are kind of um, somehow um, brought about by his actions, by his experimentation um, with, with the principle of life. So um, the natural world uh, is somehow embodied by um, this uh, creature in this novel and just as uh, how nature was hostile to human society and how society itself had been forced to go into hiding in a figurative way because of the uh, tempestuous nature of the weather between 1816 and 1818, life itself um, in the fictional landscape of uh, Frankenstein seems to have gone into hiding. Um, so the, there is that kind of metaphorical uh, signification between uh, the two. Um, and you also realize that the monster's ability to kind of withstand um, 
kind of gigantic, uh, you know, uh, proportions of inhumanity from society, the deprivation that he undergoes, uh, kind of sets him from uh, humanity. He he is somehow, um, you know, uh, subhuman because because he has experienced so much hardship and and still endures, and and that makes him kind of different to the human. And um, his indifference as well towards his victims, um, and and that also marks him out as an other. The inability to empathize uh, makes him kind of um, connected to the force of nature, which is impartial, which is indifferent to the sufferings of humanity. Nature is not capable of remorse or or of kind of any kind of justification. A, a volcano will erupt. Um, so it, it's it's like that. The way uh, the monster behaves towards his victims is like an element of nature, and 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 um, which is which is regardless to the sufferings of uh, humanity to its effects. So um, just as uh, wild nature leaves havoc um, in, in its wake, uh, Frankenstein also Frankenstein's monster also does that. Um, you know, he leaves uh, darkness and despair, and he's like an angel of death. So. Um, you can see how this criticism tries to kind of uh, make sense of a natural disaster uh, and its effects on 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 May Shelley's Frankenstein. Now uh, we need to talk about the idea of um, Prometheus. Uh, in the previous lecture, we talked about how um, you know this um, novel has its subtitle, The Modern Prometheus, and how uh, Frankenstein. Uh, the scientist can be um, seen as a, a modern Prometheus because he tries to create a new race, and Robert Walton also is is a, it's a kind of a Promethean figure because he tries to find a Northwestern Sea Passage. So, uh, so yes, they, these ideas are there, but how does the novel ultimately treat the idea of the Promethean character, uh, a character which tries to kind of um, uh, offer salvation to humanity, rescue humanity? So. Um, Although Frankenstein was published during the Romantic era, it is an anti-Promethean work in, in that it criticizes Promethean aspirations and is therefore anti-romantic because ultimately, um, if you look at the novel Frankenstein, the scientist's uh, experimentations uh, go horrifyingly wrong and, and Walton doesn't uh, kind of um, end up uh, triumphant. So the Promethean aspiration in this case is that the victor, that victor tries to occupy the role of God or the woman in giving birth to a sentient being. So that prompted an aspiration of playing God or playing the woman or playing uh, nature is kind of punished um, through that creature, that sentient being that Victor Frankenstein brings into the world. So uh, he is attacked, chastised, punished through that creature itself. Um, and, and the punishment takes the form of the deaths of his beloved um, you know, friends and, and wife. So you can see how that notion itself is criticized really powerfully in this uh, novel. So th there is an anti-romantic sentiment um, in, in, in such a kind of narrative trajectory where the Promethean figure is defeated. Uh, so it's also kind of, um, you know, anti-scientific because it, it this novel also can be seen as a cautionary tale against the um, a scientific project as well. So uh, it, it offers a lot of complexities um, to the reader to kind of, um, you know, think through. Okay, um, let's now talk about um, the resonances uh, of um, the symbol uh, that the creature uh, has become. You know, th there are uh, arguments about uh, what this monster stands for, this monster without a soul. And as Sandra Gilbert notes, there are other ways to read Frankenstein's monster as standing for Mary Shelley. So um, it can be a stand-in for the author herself and for femaleness in general. The monster can represent the uh, abjection, the rejection suffered by, um, by, by women in general. Uh, while pop culture loves to fixate on Victor as the mad scientist, some of the most moving parts of the book come from the monster's monologue, uh, which Gilbert reads as a philosophical meditation on what it means to be born without a soul or a history, as well as an exploration of what it feels like to be a filthy mass that moves and talks, uh, a thing, and other, a creature of the second sex. So, uh, while... 
you know, popular culture sees um, this as a cautionary uh, tale against the excesses of science, um, you know, uh, that's just one narrative. The second narrative, according to Gilbert, the more interesting narrative for her is that, uh, you know, the monster is given uh, remarkable dialogues, remarkable conversations uh, in this novel, remarkable monologues um, in, in this novel, and, and those monologues can be, you know, considered as philosophical meditations, ruminations of uh, this monster on what it means to have no history, no soul, no connections, no relations uh, to the rest of society. And it just becomes, uh, in the eyes of society, a, a simply a filthy mass um, that moves and talks. Um, it, it becomes an, um, an abject um, a thing, an animal, an other, a creature which is just secondary uh, to the male. So you can see the, you know, the various representations of hierarchy which can be projected onto this monster. Um, so that if, for this reason, um, this is a particularly uh, resonant uh, novel which, which will kind of find a, um, a readership among a variety of um, people across nations and um, at times. Now, ultimately, how do we see the value system of uh, this novel, Frankenstein, by Shelley? Um, who is the real monster? That can uh, be also asked of this novel. Of course, we have a very visible monster in the creature that Victor creates, but there is a symbolic monster as well, which could be the creator, the father itself, or it could be society, because it kind of turns this um, creature into a monster by rejecting it, by not accommodating it. So ultimately, both the creature um, Victor creates and Victor himself can be seen as monsters. Both cross society socially established boundaries, albeit mostly different ones. So there is a lot of border crossing happening um, in this novel. Uh, the creature crosses the border between life and death. Uh, he's kind of brought back from death, so to speak, by Victor. Um, so it crosses humanity and bestiality. Is it human or, or is it a bestial thing? Uh, you know, it, it seems to be both. Uh, the creature seems to be both. While Victor crosses the border between the human and the divine, so Victor himself, um, you know, plays both God as well as um, the human. So he also crosses various domains here, and that becomes uh, hugely problematic. Moreover, um, they also cross physical boundaries, physical borders, by pursuing each other through several different countries, thus spreading the threat they pose. Um, so this kind of threat is symbolically carried over to other countries. So Victor Frankenstein seems to be taking the idea everywhere, uh, the idea of how to kind of do this this border crossing in a way so by assembling a creature from dead parts and giving it life victor violates the sanctity of human life and death so that's that's potent that's crucial that's vital something we need to uh, remember constantly he, victor is the ultimate um you know, uh, Prometheus, who who is who does what he's not expected to do, he violates the sanctity of human life and death, and uh, thereby delineating said sanctity as a norm. So while he does, um, you know, transgress um, through his tra transgression, we are um, told that you know sanctity is the norm, uh, it, it is the ideal. The divine should not be questioned. The divine should not uh, be usurped of what it um uh, uh, it should not be usurped of its duties so that's what Victor does he usurps the rights of nature he usurps the rights of the mother the, he usurps he usurps the rights of the feminine he takes away um, you know the duties of, of someone else um, be it God be it uh, the female be it nature and that violation is punished the monster's behavior represents disregard for human life and callousness so of course the monster also um, you know transgresses by, by being inhuman uh, even though he put together from human parts so that disregard to human life and callousness is also punished uh, um, so you can see um, how through these two monsters uh, uh, the value system is reinforced um, to the reader in a very very clear uh, manner in a powerful manner if you transgress you will be punished thank you for watching uh, I'll continue the next session